Okay. Well, first, Tina, thank you again for coming down from New York to spend a few hours with us My today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have a lot of fans of the Fixus column in this audience today uh, who are uh, very much looking forward to hearing some insights directly from you. Um, so as we, uh, as we did last time, we've got our countdown clock here. Um, and we're going to just dive right into our first question today, um, which is on the role of behavior change in moving missions forward. And it's something that you certainly talk a lot about in your book, Join the Club. And I'm going to quote the book here for, for a minute for the audience. So in Join the Club, you write that the more important and deeply rooted the behavior, the less impact information will have, and the more people close their minds to messages that scare them. So given that reality, and to follow up on some of the um, remarks that we mentioned earlier, how are organizations making a shift, and how should they perhaps be, from pushing information to making their most important audience the, part of the story and, and perhaps part of the solution? Um, thanks for having me here. And I, I want to say that um, also, the, uh, as co-writer of the Fixes column. I'm a fan of many of the organizations that are here as well. Probably written about many of them. Um, so most of us are engaged in, in um, the process of behavior change, or at least the attempt to do behavior change. It's one of the biggest challenges that um, any organization faces. In the Solutions Journalism Network right now, we are struggling with exactly that issue. And you'd think we would know more about it, but, but we seem not to. Um, but the, um, the thesis of my book is that the most effective way to get someone to change isn't by giving them more information, and it's not by using um, appeals to fear. It's by giving them a new peer group to identify with. People change because their peers are doing something different and they want to be like their peers. And um, the classic example of that is Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you change because you have a new group of peers that are doing the same thing as you, holding you accountable for your behavior and supporting you. Mm -hmm. And a couple years ago, if you'd asked me um, how peer pressure can be used in a positive way for behavior change, I would have thought of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I might not have thought of anything else. But now I am seeing, and since I have my glasses on where I see <laughs> peer pressure all over the place, how, it's, how it can be used in a wide, wide variety of attempts to change behavior from um, um, personal behaviors like, like uh, um, overcoming addictions to toppling dictators and, and almost everything in between. Mm -hmm. But the, um, one of the um, interesting things in terms of, of how we um, do our communications and, and messages is that we have been focused, I think, too much on the idea of telling people um, how bad the problem is. It's sort of our first instinct when we have a, um, want to talk about getting people to, to um, change their behavior is, first of all, we tell people, teenage voting, um, that voting rates for 18 to 19 year olds are terribly low. Um, you know, one in three people in this room is gonna get diabetes. Uh, alcohol is the most used drug um, um, by African American teenagers. And that's our instinct to go to those kinds of messages. And um, I think that more and more people are finding that those are counterproductive. Mm -hmm. That they're actually normalizing the behavior you wanna change instead of marginalizing that behavior. And let me just give you an example of, of how this can work. Um, has anyone ever been in a hotel room and seen that little card in the bathroom that says, please pick up your towels because you can save the planet by picking up your towels? Well, that doesn't work, actually. Um, the, um, there was a study done that looked at what messages were most useful. And actually, the much more effective message was, um, other people pick up their towels. More effective than that was other people who have stayed in this room pick up their towels. Um, it's the O power effect that you talk about. Exactly. Well. And the person who did that study was Robert Cialdini, from, who's the chief scientist at O power. But um, people don't, the hotels don't use that message because it's so counterintuitive. I mean, how can that be? more powerful than telling people that you can save the planet by picking up your towels. But this is true all over. The, all over. Um, recycling, the most effective way to get people to recycle is by telling them your neighbors are recycling. Um, so if you want to be changing people's behavior, you need to be telling them that their peers are behaving well, 
Not that, not that their peers are behaving badly. You cannot win by trying to get people to go against their peer group. Mm -hmm. And um, one example I want to talk about is um, a campaign that I think is very, very important. It was done by Northern Illinois University in the 1980s, and they had a very big binge drinking problem, which is still a problem on many college campuses. And they had done um, a uh, campaign to, to try and do something about this by telling people um, binge drinking is really bad for you, and here's all the terrible things that are going to happen to you. And then a year later, being evidence-driven people, they surveyed the campus and found out that it had, had no effect whatsoever. And so they changed it. And then they started a campaign that said, you can drink a little, that's OK, but drinking a lot is really bad for you, and here's the bad things that are going to happen. A year later, they found out that also had no effect. And um, what they did then was take advantage of something else that had come up in the survey, which was not only was, were 45% um, of students uh, said that they drink more than five drinks at, when they go to a party, but people thought that 66% of students did. They asked people, what do you think your peers are doing? And it suddenly occurred to, to the, these um, folks at, in the health department at Northern Illinois University that kids were responding to peer pressure in their drinking, which was nothing new, but the peer pressure they were responding to was imaginary. Mm. They, were th they were responding to, in a sense, media reports that things were even worse than they were, and that created a peer pressure that wasn't really there. So then they started a campaign where they just simply published the results of the survey. They took out an ad in the school newspaper, because that's what was social media at the time, and it said uh, the majority of students drink responsibly. And it said 45% of students drink fewer than five drinks when they party, which I'm not sure that's responsible, but. <laughs> Northern oh, no. Illinois University, that's what passed for responsible. <laughs> and, um, and that worked. And that worked. Um, a year later, um, that heavy drinking at parties had dropped substantially. The perception of heavy drinking had dropped <clears throat> substantially. Ten years later, it had been cut in half. Mm -hmm. And the perception, which was still higher than the actuality, mm -hmm. had, been, had been cut in half as well. Um, so this is, I think, an example of the kind of campaign that actually does um, does create behavior change. Mm -hmm. So you've actually set me up here for where I want to go next. But question two is on solutions-based or constructive journalism. We hear uh, both, both terms used. So we talked a little bit earlier about the personal shift you made from just pointing out society's failings through reporting to covering how people are responding to those failings. And you care so much about this shift that you co-founded the Solutions Journalism Network. So um, for those of you in the audience who don't know about the Solutions Journalism Network, let's start there and just give a little bit of insight into what that is. And then we'll talk a little more about how uh, uh, you're, you're starting to shift behavior of, of your own there um, among reporters. Okay. Um, well, David Bornstein, who's the co-writer at Fix's Column, and Courtney Martin, who's also a, um, she's an award-winning writer who's done several books. The three of us founded this organization about a year and a half ago. and. Um, our goal is to legitimize and spread the practice of solutions journalism. And we define that as journalism that covers how people are responding to problems with the same degree of rigor that we would normally use to cover the problems themselves. And um, we now work with newsrooms all around the country. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to John and Kem Sawyer, who are here, because we work very closely with the Pulitzer Center. And um, we're doing a big event with them on November 12th. Um, and we work with uh, their grantees to help them do this, integrate these kinds of, of reports on how people are responding to problems into their stories. We're not saying you shouldn't cover what's wrong with society. Mm -hmm. We're saying that that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my job is I'm in charge of newsroom training, so I travel around the country and work with different newsrooms to help them integrate these projects and, um, and it basically shift their mindset a little so that they consider this a legitimate part of journalism and, and show them how other people have done it well so they can see how they can do it well also. Right. You've had a, a long career in journalism covering a lot of problems over the years. Did you have an aha moment when you said, you know, we really need to shift and, and start talking about this on a more public level in terms of the Solutions Journalism Network? I did. Um, it, in. Fourteen years ago, I was um, working for the Sunday Magazine of the Times, and I wanted to do a story on the price of AIDS drugs in poor countries and the fact that 
those drugs were so expensive that nobody in poor countries could afford to take them. And the reason they were so expensive was bad behavior by the pharmaceutical industry and its backers in Washington to, our, to um, keep countries from using generic drugs or buying or making generic drugs. And I pitched that to my editor, and he was not interested. He said, too depressing, and it's too familiar. Not necessarily the pharmaceutical company part, but the fact that everybody's going to die of AIDS, too familiar. So I repitched it, and it would th essentially the same story, the same investigation into how the pharmaceutical industry was, was, was getting Washington to pressure countries to not use generics. But this time it had a different frame, and the frame was one country that was defying this pressure to make generics and provide them to everyone who needed them um, for free, and that was Brazil. Mm -hmm. So um, this had several advantages. Um, but most important, it got into the paper. <laughs> um, it would not have otherwise. And, um, but it was far more reader friendly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a lot of people didn't want to read another story about how everyone in Malawi was going to die of AIDS, but they did want to read a story about how people in Brazil weren't dying of AIDS. Um, and it had a lot of impact. At the time, the UN was debating whether to set up the Global Fund for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, and the pharmaceutical industry was arguing these countries don't have the capacity to do this. They can't give these drugs to their people. And this showed that that was not the case. Huh. Um, and it had a lot more impact than it would have had if it had been a cri de corps about how everyone was dying in, in Malawi. And that made me think about, um, ha and of course, the, the other big advantage it, has, it had was it was, uh, it showed the whole picture. It didn't show just the, what was wrong. It also showed how people were responding, which is the whole story, mm -hmm. not just half the story. And since then, I really have focused most of what I've done on, um, on these kinds of stories. And that story was by far the most impactful thing I've ever written, the most hard-hitting thing, and it was a solution story. So as the, the folks in this room are listening to you, is there something they should be thinking about as they're trying to position their next story to a journalist, either to you or to someone else, to make sure that it's focused on, um, on our work as part of the solution? to help you see that bigger picture, or see and help any reporter see that bigger picture? I, I can tell you what I look for mm -hmm. and what I hope others look for, which, which they may not. But um, I look for evidence. Um, it doesn't have to be randomized control trials, mm -hmm. because everybody knows those are expensive and take a long time, and not everybody can afford to do them. But some kind of evidence that shows that there's something different here than what's going on somewhere else. Um, I look for what's innovative or different about what that particular um, organization or, or institution or government office or individual is doing, and replicability. Um, and, um, and then um, that's the story of what they do, I think, to me is less important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, w I write stories, mm -hmm. so I will... I will put it in story form. I will find somebody or some example to, to talk about, but that's not how it starts for me. Mm -hmm. It starts with the, with the evidence. Right. You mentioned something earlier before we started today that the, the risks, I guess, of, of solutions-based journalism are high. Right? You don't want to get it wrong because you're putting a, a new idea out there, but the rewards are, in fact, so much greater. Yeah, I think there's a re the initial resistance that we find to, to this idea <clears throat> is because in the journalism world, if you, I don't think it's any more difficult to do solutions journalism than traditional journalism, but the penalties for getting it wrong, the perceived penalties are greater. Mm -hmm. in, in our profession, if you call something um, a problem and you're wrong, mm -hmm. then that's a misdemeanor in journalism. But if you say something's working and you've gotten it wrong, that's a felony. Nobody wants to be perceived as being soft um, or you know just doing PR for an organization. Right. Now, if you do solutions journalism incorrectly, then that's what you're doing. But, but you don't have to do it incorrectly. You can do it correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we try and show people how to do it correctly. Right. Thanks to you and thanks to the Pollster Center then for making that happen. So we've got five minutes and 23 seconds left. So let's go to our third theme here, uh, big picture, what lies ahead. Um, and I want to go back to a theme that you talk about quite a bit in your book, um, the role of radical change in addressing social issues. 
uh, and your emphasis on cigarette marketing in Join the Club. So um, we're going to focus there just for a minute. So we've known for years the harmful effects of cigarettes, and we've come a long way from those days when Joe Camel was more readily known than Mickey Mouse, as you point out in the book. Um, while they're still sold in high volumes all across the country, there are some new things happening uh, that seem to be potentially shifting the tide here, you know, with CVS ending its tobacco sales, but also Australia and New Zealand switching to generic uh, packaging, mm -hmm. a move that Britain is now trying to follow. So I want to get your take on this. You know, what do you think about these latest moves? Um, will these bold new ideas work? And if not, what will? But perhaps the biggest question of all is, will positive peer pressure win the day here? Well, I think the reason I focus on this in my book is that this is a very, very clear example of, of how powerful positive peer pressure has, has been. Um, I mean, in, in, um, in the 1980s and 90s, teen smoking in the United States was astronomically high. 36% like of all high school seniors were smokers, and no one knew what to do about it. Clearly, information hadn't helped. Mm -hmm. Appeals to fear didn't help. Mm -hmm. Teenagers knew how bad smoking was for you. In fact, they overestimated the dangers of smoking. Mm -hmm. They thought it was even worse than it is. But clearly, that was part of the appeal of smoking. So I mean, what did work was the state of Florida got some money because they were one of the first states to settle in, with the tobacco companies mm -hmm. um, in the big lawsuit. And they hired an ad agency, which had no public health experience, but didn't know how to market to teenagers. And they said, what is, why do teens start smoking? A cigarette to a teen is not a delivery system for nicotine. It's a delivery system for rebellion. Huh. It's a way to be cool with your friends, to show adults you don't tell me what to do. And that's why appeals to fear don't work. Mm -hmm. The more dangerous, the better. So what they did was they created a, a marketing campaign using the kids themselves. I mean, they actually had a summit of teenagers and had them write and film TV spots that weekend. And um, they, found a way to channel that rebellion into giving the finger, basically, to the tobacco companies. All this information had been coming out because of the lawsuit about how they actually were targeting teenagers. Mm -hmm. So for example, they, had, they did a TV spot of a couple of girls making a prank phone call to, um, to someone who worked in advertising for Lucky Strike. And it ended with the girls saying, so what's lucky about Lucky Strike? Is it that I might live? And then they hang up the phone and everybody laughs. Or there was a road trip that some kids did to Philip Morris in Richmond, Virginia, and they got out of the car and they said to the guard at the gate, can we see the Marlboro Man? And they were filming the whole time. And of course, the guard, who was clueless, said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't. He just died. And in fact, the, he was the fifth Marlboro Man oh. to die of lung cancer. Um, and they put it all on. And this was hugely effective. I mean, they, Florida, over the next two years, had the, very, had the largest drop in teen smoking uh, ever, and then that went nationwide. It's, it was adopted by the Truth Campaign. Mm -hmm. and we have some folks here who actually worked on that campaign. Is that right? We do. Najma Roberts, wherever you are. <laughs> yes. I'd love to talk to you. Um, but the Truth Campaign is still doing this. They don't have money anymore. Um, but they, for example, now have a, um, their ad on, online is they show a bullseye target, and it shows a big circle from 1990 when 23% of kids smoked, and now it's down to 9%. Mm -hmm. And it says, we can finish this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great marketing yep. campaign because it, it, it's really enlisting people to say, your peers, are, your peers are joining in this to stop smoking. The brand thing is very important. And you can tell how important it is because the cigarette companies have fought it tooth and nail. I mean, they, don't, they never fight health messages. Mm -hmm. They like health messages because mm -hmm. they know they don't work. Um, <laughs> but they, they fight um, this kind of thing. Uh, Australia and New Zealand now sell a package where, the, where the, they all look exactly the same. And they have the brand written in little tiny letters on the front. And that's important because the brand is a way of te for teenagers to brand themselves. Mm -hmm. It's teenagers use the cigarette pack as a way to, to say, here's who I am. And if they can't do that anymore, it greatly reduces the appeal of a cigarette for teenagers. Um, so I'm, I'm, they're now, cigarette companies are now suing in the World Trade Organization for restraint of trade. Um, I hope they lose. Um, but Britain is trying this. There's, um, there's some discussion in the United States about it. And, I think this is the kind of campaign that I think is has proven to be very successful. Yeah. Great, great. Well, with 20 seconds left, what I'm going to say to all of you is that um, we have a copy of Tina's book, Join the Club, for everyone here in the audience today. And Tina has offered to stick around at the end to sign them for you. 
And thank you again for a wonderful conversation today, but also for the stories and the issues that you're raising on a national level. It's my pleasure to be here.